Hello, Robert Kiyosaki. This is Emergency Podcast number three. And I want to thank my friend Andy Sheckman for bringing me personally up to speed because I knew something was going wrong all these years. But I had no, I did, I did, I lost the macro. I didn't get the bigger picture of it. So this is Emergency Broadcast number three. Number one was Andy's warning about what Janet Yellen, who was the Secretary of Treasury, but she was also the head of the Federal Reserve Bank. So there's a little conflict of interest there. But how she was warning people, saying that <clears throat> Janet Yellen herself, the FDIC, and the Federal Reserve Bank will determine which banks survive and which ones die. So Andy called up. He says, we got to do emergency podcast number one. Number two is what does it mean when Japan and Mexico want to join the BRICS? And the BRICS stands for Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, Saudi Arabia, and on and on and on. <clears throat> but if you have Japan and Mexico, who are possibly as close to us as C Canada joining the opposing side, that's number two. And I think is by far the best financial literacy video I've ever done. So that was number two. Sandy, will please watch that one. It goes in depth. <clears throat> and today is number three, emergency podcast number three. And emergency podcast number three is not for you who are paying attention. Emergency podcast number three is be careful for those who are not paying attention. In other words, we're about to go into what's called the Wiley Coyote moment. Everybody's running along and says, oh, don't worry, the Fed's got my back. You know, the economy is fine. I love this guy, Biden, you know, and we're America's the greatest, the economy is safe. I was like, Tch. and when people crash, when this thing crashes, and it's coming soon, it's the people that are not prepared, the people who are not watching this emergency podcast number three, haven't watched number two or number one are the ones you're going to have to be afraid of. Be very, very afraid of those who are sound asleep at this moment because when they wake up, they're going to wonder what happened. So I'll just tell you a quick story. I went to flight school, you know, to fly these things in Vietnam, and they wanted to prepare us for the worst. So <clears throat> how did they prepare you for the worst? Well, they make it the worst. So what they did is they th take us out into the Gulf of Mexico, off of Pensacola Beach. They simulate a parachute crashing into the ocean, so it's freezing weather. <clears throat> I think the temperature was minus three degrees or something. We hang out the back. We drop into the water. We got to unhook. Then we paddle ashore, our little rubber ducks. You know, there's like seven of us in a group, and we go ashore into the swamps of Florida. And our job is to survive. <clears throat> so it's a simulate crashing in Vietnam or the jungles. And then we had to figure out how to survive. So everything is it's like a little Boy Scout camp the first day. Everybody's happy. You know, we're chugging along. This is, this is easy. This is easy. Day two gets a little bit more serious. <clears throat> then day three, we're hungry. And this is what I'm talking about. It took us till day three to turn into animals. We went primal. I, I I was ready to kill the guy next to me. You know, we just, we lost, we're starving to death. We're hungry. These guys are chasing us with guns, you know, blanks, of course, but we're running. I'm, I, I'm, I'm eating palmetto. I mean, just ripping palms apart, trying to get a little piece of nourishment, starving to death. We finally shot a raccoon and there was seven men 25-year-old men, and one little raccoon. And pretty soon, we were growling. We were just like a bunch of wolves. And, and I, the side of me came out of me that terrified me. It's what happens when you go primal after day three. So that's what emergency broadcast number three is about. <clears throat> what happens when your neighbor goes primal because they finally wake up and said, you know, I should have listened to emergency number one, emergency number two. 
in emergency number three. So I want to thank my friend Andy Sheckman for keeping me informed personally about what's going on in the world. And so, Andy, welcome back to Emergency Podcast number three. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Crazy time. So, so, really, so really briefly, could you give us an overview? Number one was Janet Yellen, Secretary of Treasury, also Fed Chairman at one time, saying that she, the FDIC, Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, and the Federal Reserve Bank would disturb, would dis, would determine which banks live or die. What, what did, why did that terrify you? That's number one. Well, that that terrified me and the people that I've been talking to over the last few weeks to a level that that I've never seen before, and, and myself personally. Let, let's break it down. First of all, there's roughly five thousand of these regional banks, and 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 these banks, Robert, are responsible for roughly 70% of all the small business loans in the United States. And the small businesses have traditionally represented anywhere near 40% of GDP in this country. They are the backbone. These are the banks where you walk in and they say, hi, Robert, how's your family? How's your dad? How's your mom? How are your kids? Uh, Oh, I'll see you at the Little League game tonight. How's the new business going? And they make loans based upon relationships, not upon balance sheets and business plans. They they are more of a piece of the community for all of middle America. And, and the majority of all the small businesses in this country have relied upon these banks because of a relationship and where a business plan and a balance sheet may not stack up so well with one of the big five or six commercial banks, it works with the small regional banks. And so what she said was when being interviewed and in a um, a house subcommittee inquiry, the uh, gentleman, the representative from Oklahoma said, Madam Secretary, I just wanna make sure we're on the same page here. You just bailed out Signature Bank and you just bailed out the depositors at, at, at Silicon Valley Bank. Now, if one of my constituents in Oklahoma who has $5 million in a, in a regional bank goes bankrupt, if the bank goes bankrupt, will that depositor be bailed out and everyone else, all of the banks in Oklahoma? And she said, no, sir, um, they won't be. It will have to be determined by an uber majority, as she termed it, between the FOMC, which is the Federal Reserve, the FDIC, uh, myself and the president. So in essence, what she was saying is that they will be judge, jury, and and executioner. But if you really look at what she's saying, she is basically saying that if you have money in any of the banks that are not systemically too big to fail, then you better get it out because they will fail and you will be bailed in. And there's nothing that you've been warned. And the question then becomes, which banks are too big to fail? Which banks are systemic? And when you have a small business or your life savings in a, in a place where you thought it was safe and isn't wasn't you never speculated to begin with, um, what's going to happen? Are you going to risk that to chance? And so she's lit a fuse under literally 5,000 banks in this country that have been the cornerstone of the small businesses and of, of middle America, forcing everyone into a handful of very large commercial banks. And and it's a very, very frightening situation for most of these people to have to come to grips with either staying with the relationships they have and hoping for the best while not really preparing for the worst or yanking their money out and moving it into one of the large commercial banks, which she's telling us will not fail. We will backstop the too big to fail banks. And in essence, she's creating socialized banking, putting everyone into just a handful of very, very large banks. I'm glad you said that. That's this book here. The Communist Manifesto, centralized banking, that they control the whole economy. It's run by the academic elite, and you and I are screwed. So that's number one. It's emergency podcast number one. Please understand that. Question is, is your money safe in a bank? Or is it going to be stolen by the banks called a bail-in? Right, correct. <laughs> So, and I'll tell you, in the last two weeks, I have never experienced the level of anxiety and fear that right. I am feeling right now. It's almost like a, a, a vat of butter poured over my head, and it's just coating me with people's anxiety. The level of fear and anxiety and um, 
it's awful. I mean, people are terrified right now and, and they don't know where to turn. Uh, some are turning to precious metals and others are turning to short-term government treasuries and others are moving to the big banks. But the amount of money being yanked out of these regional banks, which are, is going to have a domino effect, is extraordinary. And, and that's what we talked about in the first podcast. And podcast number two, which is, I think, the best financial literacy podcast I've ever done with anything. And it's about what Japan and Mexico, if and when they join the BRICS, the Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. <clears throat> and the reason I think that's probably the best I've ever done so far with Andy was his financial literacy. Do you speak the language of the banks? And that's the most important thing right now. Do you speak the same language <clears throat> the banks are speaking? So what was financial uh, emergency podcast number two? What's the significance of Japan and Mexico contemplating or already joining the BRICS? And so Mexico has formally applied. The rumor is Japan, Australia, and New Zealand are contemplating. If I had to sum it up, Robert, I guess I would say something to the extent that what it really symbolizes is that the United States and their actions have done more to destroy themselves, ourselves, itself, in the past few years than any external enemy could have ever done because we weaponize our source of power, which is the U.S. dollar. And, and we have driven most of the world away from it as a result. And the majority of the world's populations reside in the areas that comprise the BRICS, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the Belt Road Initiative, and the Eurasian Economic Union. This growing <coughs> group of, of people that are rallying together against this type of hegemony, this type of, as you called it last time, bullying um, and, and and the perception of hypocrisy, and they are rallying away from the West. And, and really, that's what it talks about, the ramifications of what really does that mean if we lose the petrol reserve status. And that's kind of what number two and number three talk about. Number two was, it's happening. And I guess today we would talk about what happens when it does happen and what yeah. is it that is happening. So please listen to number emergency podcast number two because you learn some languaging there. There's a lot to learn. Like you know, what's we didn't go over this, but Triffin's dilemma and Gresham's laws and all this stuff. America has been violating all of these laws of money for all of these years, and the world says we've had enough of this. So they're joining the BRICS: Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. And what Andy's pointing out that means seventy percent of the world's population that used to use the dollar are going to take this and say, we don't want it anymore. And so there's going to be quadrillions of dollars coming back. And the ramifications of that are possibly, and I hope it doesn't happen, but it's called hyperinflation, that this thing goes to trash. This becomes toilet paper, this little dollar here, because there's so much of it out there and when 70% of the world's population says, we're not going to use this anymore, aloha, what does that mean to the world? Which brings up number three. Yes, and it's the Wiley e. Coyote moment. And um, <clears throat> again, it's, I'm not worried about you guys who listen to one, two, and now three. But what about the person who's fat, dumb, and happy and thinks, oh, don't worry. The Fed's got our back. The economy is the best. We'll be fine. You guys are just, you know, you're chicken little saying the sky is falling. It's not falling. It's going to be fine. What happens when <clears throat> your neighbor comes knocking on your door because their kids are starving? Mm -hmm. You think they're going to be wanting your food too and your money? And that's why I told the story of the U.S. Marine Corps and the U.S. Navy throwing us out in the woods. On day three, we, we went primal. That little raccoon, I still remember it, Andy. There were seven men, 25-year-old men. You know how much we can eat at 25? And this little raccoon was smaller than a chicken. And I could hear myself growling. You know, you know how much I, I, I want that piece. You can't have that piece. You can't. And then there was another group of seven men came. They said, you kidding? No, leave us alone. You know, so there was another group coming in and said, and so they were so desperate, this other group of seven, we sold them the bones. 
<laughs> I still remember that. I said, that's a pretty good deal. We got 20 bucks for these bones here. They, they were chewing away on it. <clears throat> the point is, it's only, we're only three days away from primal. And what happens when your neighbor comes to visit you because their kids are starving? So that's the yeah. Wiley Coyote moment. So what do you see possibly happen? Well, can, can we show this clip here? Well, you want to talk about what you, what the possibility is or how far away are we from the Wiley Coyote moment? Right. And there have been a lot of things that are happening. And we'll, we'll talk about this one first. And this is the, the, the president of, of Kenya who, you know, innocently enough made uh, a deal with Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, both of which have been our allies, right? Both of which are joining the BRICS nations and the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. They're all on the Belt Road Initiative. So in and of itself, Kenya saying to Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates that we will buy your oil from now on with Kenyan shillings instead of U.S. dollars, in and of itself is not as big of a deal. I talk about the game of Jenga where you pull pieces out and finally the whole thing tips over. But what was very interesting about what he said was this piece where in the first 30 seconds, more or less what he says is, let me give you all some advice who hold US dollars. The term he uses is you should go to the nurses. Now, I guess there's a little bit of translation there that uh, in terms of his command of the English language, but he said in the next few weeks, this market will be very different. In essence, he's intimating that something, some event, whatever that event may be, is going to happen in the next few weeks that will affect the dollar, that those holding dollars should do what they need to do right now, he says, because in the next few weeks, this market will be very different. And I found it to be rather concerning on a broader sense. Again, each and every one of the things that I have talked about for the last three years, really screaming to the public in every video I've done since 2020, every one of them, the central theme has been about the loss of the petrol standard, the 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 <laughs> growing chorus of countries, starting with the Belt Road Initiative and, and ending with the, the, the BRICS nations and everything in between. Wait, wait, wait. And, and what Andy's saying is that in 1971, Nixon took this off the gold standard. They had to back it up with something. So 74, Nixon and his protege Kissinger. They went to Saudi Arabia, says, we, if you make this the petrodollar, so they went from a gold dollar to a petrodollar. And so they gave the dollar immense power throughout the world because everybody had to take this stuff here. And so what happened when China enters the scene and all this stuff is going on, what Andy's talking about, this is going to come back on us now. That's so correct. Can we, show, can, we show this, can we show this video of this guy? Then you can interpret because I, I watched it twice. I didn't I didn't quite get it. So you you can explain it better than I can. So let's let's show this little video of Mr. Bhutto or something from Kenya saying that we're not going to trade in this anymore. This is Aloha. Uh, for the people who work numbers, I am giving you free advice that those of you who are holding dollars, you surely might go into losses. You better you better uh, do what you must do because uh, this market is going to be different in a couple of weeks. And uh, secondly, uh, we, through the central bank, we are having conversations to reinstate the interbank exchange uh, market that has since uh, not worked. And I am happy that the players in that sector, including our banks, are coming forward and they are participating and uh, they are working with the central bank so that we can again uh, take charge of our market and that it is not allowed to be distorted. So, okay, so... Wait, wait, what, did he, what, what was he saying there, Andy? So, so what he was basically saying is you need to get out of dollars and you need to do it quickly. And that if you don't, the whole market is changing and you need to go see a nurse if not. And what he was basically saying is get out of dollars. And, and, and when you see that in conjunction with selling or, excuse me, purchasing oil from the UAE and from Saudi Arabia in Kenyan shillings, instead of dollars, this is a very, very ominous sign. 
amongst other a few other things that have happened since we've had our last conversation that I think are very important and must be spoken about and, and how it all affects this moment when the world snaps their fingers and no longer takes dollars for oil. The ramifications of that are extraordinary and will be very similar to what you spoke about at the beginning of this conversation, where, you know, if the dollar collapses and every all those dollars come flooding home and interest rates spike to the moon, everything in this country changes in the blink of an eye. Not only are the three pillars of wealth, stocks, bonds, and real estate, inversely correlated to a rise in interest rates, and we're not talking about a 25 or 50 basis point interest rate hike and you can see just raising interest rates to four, four and a half percent has already almost broke the entire world financial banking system. But I'm talking the world dumping dollars globally because they no longer need to hold it to own oil. The ramifications of that and hyperinflation as those dollars come flooding home, because as you mentioned, every country's had to own dollars since 74 in order to buy oil. It's created this synthetic demand. The, the ramifications of dollars being globally dumped simultaneously in favor of another settlement currency for oil is it, it, it's, it's terrifying because okay. everything that makes people feel wealthy in this country is inversely correlated to that moment. And when the dollar dies, along with stocks, bonds and real estate, what does that mean? What does that mean in the analogy of seven hungry Marines eating a raccoon? <laughs> when the supply chains are completely broken, the dollar is worthless, the grocery stores are empty, people have no cash, they're ill-prepared for what is coming. So yes, they will come knocking. And as, as, as um, you know, as in my mind's eye, I guess I would say when people have nothing to lose, they lose it. And that's the kind of environment that I would envision, God forbid, that we're not so really far away from when you look at the pieces that are putting being put into place. I'd like to mention one in particular, and, and it's really being overlooked, in my opinion, um, by the media, and I don't quite understand it. And this is the, the, the peace deal that has been brokered, you know, by the only adult in the room, and that has been China, uh, brokering a peace deal between Saudi Arabia and, and um, uh, Iran, to and, enemies. And, and also, isn't Saudi Arabia, Iran, Iraq also? Well, Iran and Iraq, they've also brokered a peace deal between Iran and Iraq, where they've now built a railway between the two countries. Yeah. They are mending fences. But in terms of what happened in Saudi Arabia, you know, here you've got Sunni and Shiite. They've been at each other's throats for centuries. And it is a reconciliation between the two countries brokered by China and the two countries are now reestablishing the, uh, diplomatic ties and opening embassies in each other's country. And, and, and then also what happened was when Biden went to Saudi Arabia, they didn't even talk to him. You know, because why would they talk to him? And he's a woke guy. He says, we're going to we're going to put oil out of business. Well, well, that's I'm going right. to talk to Biden. You know what I mean? Right. But when, when Xi goes in, the guy ahead of China, he gets a royal welcome because he's going to buy oil from Saudi Arabia. And it was Biden who cut down the Keystone XL pipeline that sent oil from $30 a barrel to $130 a barrel, which destroys the middle class because they can't afford, they got to choose between putting gas in the car or eating. And that's why I was, I used the example of sitting there with this one little raccoon. And at least we had something. But when the other seven guys came across and they were starving also, you have not lived and seen desperation like that. And I'm saying to all of you, if you kids are starving, what would you do? If you're concerned about high inflation, looming recession, a stock market correction, or out of control spending in Washington, this is an important message to hear. Because the fact is, during every major crisis in U.S. history, many of those who fail to prepare watch their savings, investments, or retirement funds go down. While many with the foresight to own gold help preserve their purchasing power. Gold even made some folks richer. Now we're facing several major crises at once, and experts say we may soon face even more economic trouble. So please don't wait. Learn the simple way you can diversify with gold and put yourself on the road to financial peace of mind, even in uncertain times. The new free 2023 Gold Guide from our friends at Gold Alliance can show you how. 
Just visit www.freegoldguide.com slash Robert or call 1-800-473-4585. Republican governor and conservative commentator Mike Huckabee says Gold Alliance is the only gold provider he recommends to his friends and family. Find out why and visit freegoldguide.com slash Robert or call now at 1-800-473-4585. Feeling powerless over current events and your financial future? Financial freedom is your freedom. Robert Kiyosaki is the best-selling author of Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Over 40 million people have taken Robert's advice. Now it's your turn. Attend Robert's free virtual wealth building event. Claim your free access now at richdadfree.com. Don't wait. Access is limited. Go to richdadfree.com. That's richdadfree.com. And, and it's a really big point, what you're bringing up, in that the, the groups, the, the 150 plus countries on the Belt Road, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which is 60% of human population in and of itself, or pretty darn close to it, the Eurasian Economic Union and the BRICS, all of them together are north of 80% of human population who are not going green. And you add the other countries, 60 of them, more, including Mexico and including perhaps Japan, and including perhaps Australia and New Zealand, those aren't even part of the 60, that are applying or have expressed interest into applying, you're dealing with the majority of human population who isn't going green. And what China is doing is around cooperation, upon reconciliation. They're going into countries like uh, um, South America. They're going into... To, um, uh, Africa, they're going into the Arab states and they are building infrastructure. They're, they're building bridges, they're building roads, they're bringing, building ports, they're building oil refineries. They're but what, what, what Andy is saying is I was in Zimbabwe and I was, you know, we fly helicopters out there to go hunting. And this guy says, that's a Chinese compound there. And there was like this college campus filled with Chinese people, building infrastructure. Then we were in, uh, i got a quick name of the com- country, but they were putting in fiber optic cable for the country, the Chinese were. They're doing all the things that makes a country richer, but they're countries with resources, I mean, with stuff that the Chinese want to use. So we send their, our cheap-ass dollars, these things here, we buy their... We buy their, you know, gold, silver, oil, copper. We pay them with fake money, but the Chinese go there and actually make their economy stronger via infrastructure. And I've seen these large campuses of Chinese people. I'm going, holy mackerel! This is about the last ten years. That's what Andy's talking about here. So when you see it, you go, "What the hell is the U.S. doing?" Right? right. I mean, that's really what the question is. And they're coming in and they're industrializing these countries that in a mutually beneficial way, giving the hope of a middle class, the hope of a better life and um, and doing it the right way with cooperation instead of coercion. And look, this is the first time in arguably five centuries that that you, you don't have a political leader from the West setting the global agenda here. This is this is Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin that are setting the global agenda by going into these countries and making uh, life better for everyone and mending fences and reuniting uh, countries that have hated each other forever under a common goal. Of- they're, not, they're not stealing the country's wealth with fake money. Correct. You Correct. see, when, when they spell quantitative easing, that's called counterfeiting money. So right. all the US had to do was print this stuff and you could steal a nation's wealth. You could go to the Congo and take out all the stuff, the diamonds, the oil. You could you could go to oil producing countries, steal their wealth with fake money. And what Andy is saying, it's over, right? Is that what you're saying? It is. And I think the common the common thread in all of these unions and all of this infrastructure and all of this cooperation is the drive toward mutual settlements in national currencies between Asia, Africa, and Latin America, for all practical purposes, uh, Putin said, look, we're endorsing the role right now 
of the Chinese yuan as the new trade currency while the complex discussions of our new BRICS currency or our new Shanghai Cooperation Organization settlement currency backed by gold and other commodities proceed. They went in there and said, we want to use the, the yuan right now in order to, uh, to bridge the gap between the new currencies that we will issue as a united front that will be pegged and back to commodities. The de-dollarization, the lack of demand for the dollar is going to increase inflation exponentially. And that's not even talking about when the switch is flipped and they all dump things at the same time. And if you look at what the two of them said as they parted ways just the other day in their meeting, uh, Xi Jinping says to Putin, and they have this on camera, he says, now there are changes that haven't happened in 100 years. And when we are together, we drive these changes. Putin says, I agree. You are witnessing a hundred year change. And when the switch flips, all of these countries have joined together in, in harmony, in mutual beneficial trade, in, in, in a united front against the hegemony and hypocrisy that they perceive from the West. And they split the switch and they dump dollars globally, it will be a religious experience in this country. If you are not prepared, you're dead. And that's, that's what that guy from Kenya was saying. Yes. You better go to a hospital now. Yes. That's exactly yeah. what I was saying. And, and Anyway, oh, I'm going to get to a solution right now. Again, I would strongly suggest people watch Emergency Podcast number one. I think number two is the most for financial literacy. Do you speak the language of the banks? And then number three is that it's the people who are not watching these three videos that you have to worry about. And that's why I sit at my desk with my little dirty Harry pistol here, you know, and um, because I've, you know, I'm a Marine. I've been at, in my own homes. I've had people break in, you know, in Hawaii. And when people are desperate, desperate people do desperate things. They do. And, and we're, we're getting there now. Now, I can't confirm this, but I'd like to mention, you know, I, I made a comment the other day. I said, look, you know, part of this happening is because the U.S. in essence has stole the exchange reserves of Iraq, Iran, Venezuela, Afghanistan and and Russia to the tune of trillions of dollars, right, through sanctions and whatnot and war. And, and someone said to me, by the way, the president of Venezuela just said the exact same thing that the president of Kenya said. Now, I can't confirm it, but I was just told this today or yesterday, last evening, that that happened, that, that, that the Venezuelan president said that at the exact same time. And so this is the rallying cry. I would like to bring up one other thing that's very interesting. I was reading a report by, a uh, gold report by the uh, Toronto Dominion Bank, a TD bank, a Western friendly bank. And they talked about gold going up to $2,000. And it was very interesting to me that the opening says the West's loss of control over commodity pricing is a slow burning theme with significant implications for pricing, inflation, currencies, geopolitic, uh, and geopolitical uh, politics over the coming decade. You have a Western bank, one of the largest banks in Canada, saying that the West is losing control over the ability to suppress the gold and silver market and other commodities. And this is why you are seeing the smart money bleed dry all of the exchanges of the world, of their commodities, not just gold and silver, zinc and aluminum and all the soft and hard goods that are disappearing off the Comex and the London Metals Exchange. They are front running what they see coming. So yeah, I'd love to talk about the solution. I think that's a yep. great idea. So that's why, would you explain what Miles Franklin does? And But you know, to be perfect for disclosure, I do buy from <clears throat> Andy Sheckman. I make no commissions. I don't get it. I, I am a consumer just the way because I, I like, but education, I get along with the products I buy. So this here is a silver coin. This is about 35 bucks today. I mean, everybody in the world can afford 35 bucks, but they'd rather hang on to this toilet paper here. And this is a gold coin. And this is this is March 2023, 30, 30 bucks. This is about 2000 something. And I think this is the biggest bargain of all is that silver, because silver is consumed in everything. You know, all the solar panels, every, you know, these are Tomahawk missile, got 30 pounds of silver and it. it goes boom in the desert. 
you know, uh, EV electronic vehicles are going to burn this stuff here. And everybody can afford 35 bucks. But will they do it? No, they're going to hang on to this garbage here. I'm going to say one more thing. There's a thing called Treffen's Dilemma. Treffen's Dilemma meant that for the U.S. to be the world's money, a, a reserve currency in 1944, they had to print extra of this. So the whole world had this in their banks all over the world. They have more of this stuff than any other product in history. This is toilet paper. And what that guy was saying from Kenya is when this stuff starts coming back in, it's just not how much they print it. It's how much they've had in storage because they had to be able to buy oil in this stuff here. So what's going to come back is a tidal wave of this toilet paper upon America. And this little $35 coin here, I don't, I don't like to make predictions, but I'd rather have this than this here. And it's really tough to get people to say, no, I'd rather have toilet paper. It, it makes no sense to me. So please explain what Miles Franklin does. And I, I am, for full disclosure, I am a customer of Andy, but I am a customer of him because I like what he teaches me about money. No, you're, you're very kind. And you're, and what you just said is exactly right, Robert. It, it is the, this is the dilemma. And the dilemma is you can see if you take a step back, and I mentioned Jenga, what Kenya did in and of itself by, by saying we're going to pay for this stuff and, and what Saudi Arabia and UAE said, okay, we'll take your Kenyan shillings instead of dollars, in and of itself isn't as big of a deal until you put all of these things into context that we've been talking about since the very first time that we did a podcast last August. And they're all growing with, uh, with severity and, and, and with frequency. And it's happening. The de-dollarization is real. The union of these countries against the West is real. And if and when they all dump dollars and the tidal wave of dollars come home, it creates a massive problem against everything in this country that is valued opposite a spike in interest rates. So you're right. Yes, we sell precious metals. And I think our prices are, are arguably the best in the United States. We've never had a customer. Wait, 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 wait there's one more thing I want to say, Andy. You guys can supply. No, no, and that doesn't make sense. Supply, which, oh, I'm glad you brought that up, actually. You know, Wait, because, because the guy I used to buy from before, I went to see him. I needed some silver. He says, I'm out. I can't supply you. I'm going, wait a minute. The clock is ticking here. You know, the yeah. price is moving, and he can't supply. And so that's why I, I started searching around. And that's when I met Andy. I went, okay, this is it. He can supply. And you've never had a complaint, have you, all these 30-something years? 34 years, we've never had one in approaching $9 billion in sales. And we may be the only major company in America. $9 billion with a B? $9 billion, And we're licensed and bonded in the state of Minnesota, where I left my corporate office when it's been there for, for 34 years. I live in Florida now, where we've had a satellite office. But Minnesota is the only state that mandates licensing and bonding in what is a federally non-regulated industry. Between that and our U.S. Mint accreditation as one of 27 authorized resellers, we, I believe, are held to the highest standard in the industry. But what you just said, look, for the last couple of years, along with talking about the BRICS and de-dollarization, I've talked about what I believe the market will ultimately look like, my market. And I said it will ultimately be defined, similar to the way that your local coin guy uh, mentioned to you, in inability to source product, because there are six major mints in the world. United States, Canada, Austria, Australia, South Africa, United Kingdom. In the last week, we have been informed by two of the six mints. Number one, the Austrian mint has gone on what's called allocation. That means that you're, you can't buy whatever you want. You'll get a small allocation, and they are basically uh, have more, more demand than they do supply. That's not a good sign. Number two, the Royal Canadian Mint came out and said, oops, we're really sorry. We overcommitted. We don't have enough product. You may have to tell some of your clients that you'll, you'll give them their money back. It could be a couple of months. And our last shipment from them was roughly half of what we had originally agreed to. And for the last three years, the United States Mint, which has meant more to my career than roughly any, anyone or anything, uh, has been the model of inefficiency. They've been working at half capacity. And 
even though they claim otherwise, where they've made roughly 25% of the amount of silver eagles that they could and they have in the past, and they're selling at seven, eight dollars, nine dollars more than everything else is wholly inefficient. So you look at the six mints, one is on allocation, one is massively backordered months, and the other is running at 50% capacity. That leaves three of the six mints all across the Atlantic, and we're all fighting for the same small pool of gold and silver to protect ourselves from what's coming. So yes, we can deliver and we've always been able to, and I've bought everything that wasn't nailed down over the past, really since Thanksgiving, everything, deep into my line of credit, buy it all, and it's disappearing. And we did more business in the past 14 days than I have done in years before. Our last year was our biggest year. We did 15% of last year's volume in the last two weeks. And people are terrified and there's a very strong motivation when you're scared and the interesting thing robert in, in wrapping all this up to what you said and how you said it was was really cool is that the people who understand it are like the starving marines freaking out for the little bit of gold and silver that there is get my money out of the bank the people who haven't figured it out yet when this hits when this moment happens of global de-dollarization, when this, the banking crisis accelerates, like we talked about in number one, whatever the, the fuse that is lit that blows the whole thing, there's so many people that are ill-prepared for what's coming, whether it be financially, spiritually, uh, um, emotionally, I mean, any of it, they're just not prepared. And I think that's when things get really frightening, when you talk about insurrection, when you talk about having to sit in your bedroom with a gun on your table. These are things that you don't want to think about, but honestly, it's that serious. It truly is. And then you look at all of the things that have happened on the periphery, the, all of the, the disruptions with food processing plants and eggs and, and bird flu and the chickens and everything. It's the perfect storm happening all at once. And I don't want to be an alarmist, but there, there is nothing wrong with preparing in every way as if a hurricane is coming tomorrow. In fact, that's what Jamie Dimon said. He said a hurricane is coming, not a storm, but a hurricane. And if you prepare as though it is a hurricane, and in, in, in the words of Xi Jinping, a hundred year hurricane, then I think you will be far better off than just sitting and being reactionary. You must be proactive. And, and you know what? If you have to donate some food to a food shelf, if you have to give your gold and silver to your children or to a church or to anyone that means anything to you, if you have stockpiled this stuff to protect your family prematurely and it doesn't pan out, who cares? But it could save your life and not only allow you to survive, but maybe even thrive when the dust settles and there will be opportunities that will blow people's minds when valuations meet an equilibrium with interest rates, valuations in asset prices. And those that haven't been wiped out will be able to then come in and rebuild and, and take advantage of, of generational opportunities. Anyway, so I, I was at uh, Safeway and they had five cans of tuna for a buck. So I went, oh my God, something like that it was cheap as heck. No, I, was, I forgot the price, but I was going... God, this 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 tuna can is pretty good because tuna is a derivative of diesel. Do you, do you know what I mean? Yeah, it, absolutely. Can't, Don't have diesel, you can't catch tuna. tuna, right? There's one more thing I want to say that you know that you've talked about is you know we had Credit Suisse go down and that's a bond failure, but Deutsche Bank is a derivatives failure. Now people, are, what the what's them doing a, a bond and a derivative? So what happened is for the last since 2008 they've been dropping interest rates. And then when they raised interest rates, the bond started to explode because you had a, you have a bond that's paying 2% and now a bond is paying 8%. The 2% bond collapses, the bank collapses. And that's where the runs of the bank come from. But Deutsche Bank is derivative failure. And derivatives are what Warren Buffett calls weapons of mass financial destruction. And the derivatives market is one quadrillion. So we're not, not speaking about trillions anymore. We're speaking about quadrillions. And a quadrillion is a thousand trillion. So when these things start to explode and they don't want them anymore because the BRICS was going to take this down, 
you're going to wish you had some more of these $35 silvers because this is still real money. This is real money. You know, this here is 1964, a Kennedy half dollar. It's still pure silver. It's worth $10 today. Do you know what I mean? This is $10, but it was 50 cents back in 64. So all of this is coming to a head right now. And I, I really thank you for the friendship. And then, you know, uh, again, full disclosure, I am a customer of Andy Sheckman, Miles Franklin. Please go to their website, check them out. But as he says, it's getting tougher and tougher to supply because even Warren Buffett, who called this rat droppings, is buying gold now. Yeah, it's true. One last thing, uh, and, until our new website is launched very shortly, please send any questions or inquiries or price inquiries for a current price sheet. We will not be undersold to info at Miles Franklin, info at Miles Franklin. Just write Rich Dad in the in the subject line, and, and my brokers will make damn sure that you are all treated as family. You will be given the best price in the country. We will answer all your questions with no obligation whatsoever. And one last thing, when you mention a quadrillion is a thousand trillion. Oh. A trillion seconds ago was 31,688 years ago. So put that into your mix and try to figure that out. 31,000. So if you made a machine that printed dollar bills every second without stopping to reload paper or change ink, it would take 31,688 years to make one trillion. Multiply that times a thousand, the earth wasn't even here. So this is why he calls it weapons of mass destruction. And, and I guess one very, very last thing, this is exactly why the Federal Reserve quietly, no one talks about this. Everyone talks about Signature Bank, Silicon Valley Bank, uh, uh, UBS bailing out Credit Suisse. But how about the fact that the second largest bank in the world, I believe they're called Swiss Bank Corporation, was given a $20 billion lifeline by the Federal Reserve a few weeks ago, $20 billion. Why? exactly what you just said, the derivative exposure, the incestuous commingling of derivatives between all of these uh, banks and corporations and funds where the value of those derivatives is based upon the counterparty's ability to perform. Well, if a counterparty goes boom, what does that mean to the derivatives? And everyone has derivatives with everyone else. It's a daisy chain that brings them all down. It's a very frightening thing. And this is exactly why Holding physical precious metals is not an investment. It's wealth that is not simultaneously someone else's liability. And a derivative is exactly the opposite of that. Its value is based upon the counterparty's ability to make good. And so having that removal of liability and of counterparty risk, I believe, will be the biggest single topic of discussion in the months and years ahead because we have found ourselves in a system that just can't survive under the conditions that are approaching. So I love the opportunity to talk to you. You're so, you're, you're so um, interesting to listen to, and I, I appreciate very much our friendship as well, Robert. And I look forward to seeing you next week in Arizona. Yeah, thank you very much. So all of you, please, you know, number one, emergency podcast number one, number two, and now number three. But the, I'm not concerned about you. I'm concerned about the people who have no idea there's one, two, and three, and they don't care because they hope America will shine again or the world's going to save us and everything be happy days are here again. There's This is trash. So thank you all very much, and thank you, Andy, and thank you for listening to Rich Dad Radio, the uh, emergency podcast number three. <laughs>